I remember growing up, uh, I didn't recognize dementia as being a disease that affected my community. I didn't see my face. I didn't see my face on the website. I didn't see faces like mine in the literature. And because of that, I feel a lot of the conversation didn't happen. So the Alzheimer's Society of Canada um, National Dementia Guidelines Black Community Working Group. It's a long title, we've got an acronym, but I know healthcare is filled with acronyms, so I won't share that. It is a group that serves to educate. It is a group that also serves to implement information that can be disseminated to families who are impacted with dementia. But the information is mainly communication for healthcare providers for the family and those living with dementia. I thought that whatever little voice I could lend to this entire agenda, I would be, a, be more than willing to be a part of it. We've been able to capture the various experiences of care partners, person living with dementia, healthcare professionals who work in different settings, whether it's a family physician in a community practice or a clinician, someone who uh, works with people living with dementia and their families in a hospital setting. This is a personal cause for me because it it's going to impact the future of people that I know, my parents, my family members, and one day, probably myself. I just feel like I couldn't keep what I'd learned on my journey, what little I, I felt I, I knew. Um, I just felt like I, I needed to share it. I felt like I needed to be able to support other caregivers. So we've been able to gather various perspectives and expertise to help inform and, inf and advise physicians on, you know, how do you communicate a diagnosis of dementia? Um, or what are the factors to consider when communicating that diagnosis to people from black communities? For us, there is this thing that we want to do at home. We always want to try things at home first before we go to the doctors. When do you go to a doctor? When do you approach a doctor? What do you ask a doctor? And I think that the, doc the way we've done our documents in addressing those questions will help others be um, able to have a guide or a path, a direction to take. Community is one of the things that dementia gives you. It gives you a sense of, of uh, we're all in this together. And it's really personified when combined with the richness of, of blackness that uh, that is that, the, that my group just exudes. They are caregivers of the highest order. My mom. <laughs> wow. My mom, she's an amazing person. Her name is Sonia, Sonia Elizabeth Cox. As long as I can remember my mom, my earliest memories of her is that she's always working hard. She is always trying to be the best and do the best for everyone. And when it became evident that something was happening to my mom, I guess I could say that's the one thing I could say that this disease has done is slowly taken her away piece by piece. As long as she smiled, I felt good seeing her smile. But she doesn't smile anymore. I've had bad days since my mom became sick, and I still go to her. And somehow I feel her, and I hear her. I think that's one of the things, like, you know, I thought about what to bring today, an object. I brought her a wedding ring. That's something that I wear. It doesn't fit me, but I keep it with me. But the one thing I can say that my mom still gives to me is her strength, even in the depth of her silence. Even in all that this disease has taken from her. My mom was a hugger and a kisser. She loved to hug, she loved to kiss. My kids call her, her grandkids call her, Grandma Wet Kisses, because she loves to hug and kiss you. And this picture represents the fullness of my mom. In our community, um, in the black community, it's, it's really not a topic of conversation. When it comes to that stigma, 
I think there's just a, a mix of all different things in terms of why we don't talk about it, why we don't deal with it, just maybe lack of understanding and denial. I've been a, um, a person li living with dementia officially, i.e. after diagnosis, in tw since 2011. My vascular dementia is a result of uh, small veins being blocked throughout my brain. The, the um, focus on cognitive disorder, cognitive loss, loss of memory, all that, that stuff. That's only the tip of the iceberg. The true change, core change that happens in dementia is the loss of self. That sense of who you are, how you are, what you are, and why dissipates. And you have to re regroup and readjust and learn to accept the true you that's finally having a chance to come to the surface. The true you that challenges all the world around you. The true you that is confused by all the world around you. Stigma has just added another component to that, i.e. now is, is, is um, the fear of dementia. The fear of society around me um, is very frustrating to, to see the fear in people's eyes, to see the fear in their body language. There are many faces of um, dementia. We have to respect and understand people's um, and individuals' um, cultural norms, understand their perception, understand their values and their beliefs, and incorporate that into the management process. A person with dementia lives in the subconscious, and that's what society has a hard time li living with us, because the 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 barrier between a conscious and a subconscious thins, and a subconscious starts coming through, and the real you starts showing up, and society can't deal with it, so they can't craft, craft a lie to put you in your put you back in the box of society's um, uh, ex expectations. So the racism, ageism is exacerbated and revealed by dementia. I think this was maybe my daughter's second birthday. I really cherish this picture because it's showing these three generations that went through the journey together. So I was um, formerly a, a caregiver to my mom. Um, she passed away 11 years ago tomorrow. When she was diagnosed in uh, 2000 and around 2010, the year after my daughter was born, um, I really didn't know a whole lot about it because she was with me. Definitely um, having her with me to see me get married, uh, to see me have my first child was beautiful. Um, and she was there for my daughter's birth as well. So she sat through the night, sat at my bedside, and um, coached me along, warned me not to take the epidural. <laughs> um, so it was, it was rewarding in that way. I think uh, one of the harder things, of course, was just um, watching um, the person that I knew transform. So um, with each step, um, with each visit, with each um, doctor's visit, just seeing um, how she was changing and how she wasn't able to do some of the things that <clears throat> she loved to do. And um, I feel like she was at the point where she um, she understood the implications of that, and I could just see her demeanor change, and uh, just a sad moment. And around 2012, she was declining. She had um, had a few accidents at home, um, 
and um, I just felt like I had a decision to make. So uh, she did go to a retirement home. It wasn't a popular decision with my family, to say the least. And then um, in February uh, of 2012, got a call from the home that she'd had a stroke, Take her, took her to the hospital, and uh, she passed away on uh, March 2nd. In working with the Black community, especially when you're not from the Black community, is just recognizing that um, you have to take your time, you have to build the trust. It's understood uh, by many people of color that there is racism involved in the healthcare uh, network. Historical mistrust is due to uh, is rooted in colonization and exploitation. When you look at the forefathers of medicine who are European-based, we understand that unfortunately a lot of the, um, the experiments were, were handed down to my community uh, in a cruel and unusual manner. Experiments were done without our permission, against our will. Um, experiments were done without proper anesthesia. We're not talking just 500 years ago, 400 years ago. We're talking as recently as this century, right? So um, it's very important to be able to acknowledge that, but also help the community become a lot more comfortable in knowing that we're making the changes or trying to um, move forward. That is where um, increased visibility and representation of black, health, uh, black physicians uh, is important because we have to, you know, be advocates for our black community. And that's when they see themselves in us, that's stimulates um, engagement that, that can build trust. One of the big issues is access. And when we think about just access to um, a specialist, access to a physician, if black individuals are living in a marginalized area where there's limited resources, limited physician, family physician availability, if they don't have a family physician assigned to them, you know, then they fall through the cracks. There are not a lot of culturally specific programs. There's nothing within the black community. When they see something that is culturally specific, then the buy-in is there. People will be more willing to accept the services. It speaks to how important it is to want something when you see people that look like you. So this is my dad. Uh, chief Michael Dikume in his full regalia, the Red Cap Chief in my Igbo culture. Um, I'm from Anambra State in Nigeria. My dad's uh, dementia journey, uh, you know, uh, was almost a decade. I was living abroad at that time in the UK. My mom would say, oh, he's forgetting things. And at that time, because of culture, um, our culture, we tend to confuse dementia with age-related decline. And um, so that was what it was put down to. And hindsight, looking back, he's that we didn't seek uh, diagnosis clarification early on. One of the proudest moments of my dad was when I became a medical doctor. And it's like, he kept, uh, it was a proud moment for him. He was like a peacock. And for every one or two people that he, that he, he encountered, he would say, have you met my daughter? She's a doctor. <laughs> I won't be here today if not of um, my dad's value uh, in education. And um, I'm very, I was privileged to, still privileged, uh, to call him my dad. He, he was exceptional. With the black population, there is a lot of emphasis on, you know, your faith. Many people believe in a higher power. A lot of us um, are Christians and we believe that, 
you know, there's nothing that God can't do. And so when you encounter the healthcare system and you have this big, powerful doctor that has given you a diagnosis and you're saying, you know what, I want to hold off on the medications because I'm going back to my church. We're going to pray on it. It's important to recognize that this is important to them. Yes, pray. Involve God or the higher being that you believe in to be a part of the conversation. But I think it's also important to understand dementia and mental health isn't something you just pray away. It's something that you actually do need to seek uh, support with from professionals and healthcare professionals, namely. And it's something that um, can be done in tandem. There's no right or wrong to that. It can be done at the same time. Especially for our black community, it's important for us healthcare professionals to utilize compassionate uh, language uh, and empathetic approach and, and respectfully disclose dementia diagnosis. And what it essentially means is um, respecting and understanding people's culture, their values, their concerns, their perception, and integrating that in the management uh, process. Just another one. She'd always try to speak life into me, just um, making sure that she was growing a confident, loving little girl. And <laughs> I think I look pretty confident here. Mom, so vibrant, loved to laugh, loved to socialize, loved people, loved her family. And um, I still see pieces of that. It's not quite the way it used to be. Mom was always that person. <laughs> she would always come to my room, write a little note, or I'd come home from school and there's a note on my pillow just expressing some type of love. I am what you call a sandwich generation caregiver. Uh, that means um, it's a person who is caring for aging parents, someone who has uh, young children, managing all the in, in and outs of young children, and of course still working. There are times where it becomes a little, I'd say more so in the, maybe some months ago, a year ago or so, I, I became angry because I thought, this isn't how it's supposed to play out, at least not right now. You're supposed to be able to be a grandmother to my grandchild. My nephews got that. How come I didn't get that? So I had to um, reconcile some of those feelings. It's literally waking up every day though, even now, my daughter's four, but you wake up every day and it's, whose needs do I take care of first, right? Um, but again, I have to always make sure that it comes from a place of love. Um, I never want it to come from a place of resentment because I'd never felt that from her, so I definitely don't want to return that to her. Um, but where it is, it's hard because I literally see the changes happen. I feel as though maybe every three months there's a change, every four months, and then she's stable again, and then there's a dip again, and then she's stable. And every time I see that dip, I have to take a deep breath and, and, and just try to count my time. I try and count my time with her and I think that's what becomes really difficult for me. I try to be in the present and try and enjoy as much of who she is still from day to day. Periodically, she, she comes back. There's a glimpse of who she is and she will hug me and say, thank you. Thank you so much. She does that, and I really appreciate it. And as dementia does, it takes away as well as it gives. What it's given me is time to, as a high-functioning uh, person living with dementia, where I can continue my life of service, is what my mother taught me. And um, so I'm able to continue that and be of service in a society that has great difficulty with people living with dementia. 
And I think it's a fear of the stigma within the community as well that, you know, oh, you've got this sickness, there's something wrong with you, um, you know, maybe we're not going to invest any time or resources in you because you're old anyways. You know, there's a stigma that when you have a, a, any type of mental illness, it's a madness or you're mad and you're automatically sentenced and you're written off and it's a thing to not talk about. The point about stigma is society's not trying to save you they're trying to save themselves. So there's all these kinds of challenges or stigma that might come across um, to folks in the black communities. And that's where I think it's so critical that we engage with our, our communities and we have representation. So we need um, more culturally competent and diverse healthcare professionals in the healthcare setting. They need to focus on the individuality of the individual that is before them. And they need to lose their, uh, their divided attention that is grasping for symptomology. They need to uh, understand that in person living with dementia, their vulnerability is, is complete, total. Their inner self is being is exposed. I think the important thing is meeting people where they're at. Instead of coming in with our own agenda or goals or questions we may want, I think starting with open-ended questions as to how can we help you um, is a key place to start. Just education, compassion, empathy, um, not treating patients like a number. Building that trust starts with being authentic, not rushing people, and not going in with your own agenda. The last thing that we want is for someone to go home and just not know what to do. It's not fair to them, it's not fair to the person that they're caring for, and, um, and so I would just ask for more care and attention when it comes to that. It's not a journey to do by yourself, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. There's hope and there, are, there is support available and we can learn from one another as we journey on this path. We are stronger together and we can face uh, this together. Stories are powerful and I think the more we share our stories and understand each other, um, the better that will be for not only our generation, but future generations. I'm hopeful that uh, when it comes to the conversation of dementia and um, mental health, that we continue to demystify it. This has changed my life both personally and professionally. I am even more motivated to advocate for the health of, of my black community. My basis of hope is perhaps a little different. <laughs> My hope is, is instilled with the knowledge of the certainty. The certainty of having the dementia gives me hope because the certainty is something that I can be comfortable with or accept, and it's not an easy acceptance. I'm not being glib. It was not an easy thing. The acceptance of it now gives me hope because the certainty of it is such that I need not worry about it. It's just there, and I get on with my life. So I have hope in this certainty, as I have hope in, this, in the revelation of the true, my, my true self coming out. That's hope because my true self is coming out. I'm accepting it, and I'm glorifying in the fact that I can finally be me, and that's the way it is.